Hi everyone, this is Miriam Naime from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging webinar. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Turing. And the Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence. One of the objectives of the Turing is to apply data science on real world problems such as we are, what we are doing at the Vehicle Integration Group, where we are supporting the decarbonization of transport and electricity infrastructure. On the webinar, we hosted uh, several talks covering uh, communication protocols for electric vehicles, the charging infrastructure rollout plans in several countries, and cybersecurity topics. You can find uh, the slides and the uh, playlist on YouTube and on our landing page. Next week, we are hosting a webinar on cybersecurity. And in a couple of weeks from now, we have a, a technical uh, webinar on cryptography applied to electric vehicles. Without further ado, we're delighted to have with us today um, Dr. Andrew Thompson from the Router Group, who's going to talk to us about V2 X, V to everything. Andrew will talk, will explain what is V to X, give an overview of relevant techno economic factors such as the cost due to battery degradation or possible battery degradation from V to X and some regulatory issues. Andrew held uh, several research positions at renowned universities and uh, uh, served as a member of the IEA Task Force on Home Grid and V2X. Andrew, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Miriam. So I am very happy, very thrilled to be here with everyone today uh, to present some work that I published with a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Yannick Perez. And uh, so the the title of today's webinar is Vehicle to Everything, V2X, Energy Services, Value Streams, and Regulatory Policy Implications. And so my name is Andrew Thompson, and I work at the Brattle Group. And here at, at Brattle, uh, we answer complex economic, regulatory, and financial questions. And we work in a wide range of industries where we provide independent, clear, and rigorous analysis and expert advice for our clients. And we really believe in the power of economics to derive clarity in the face of complexity. So that's a little bit of a background of the Brattle Group. And so I'd like to preface this with saying that this is work that I published prior during my time in academia. And as such, the views expressed in this presentation are strictly my own and do not necessarily state or reflect the views of the Brattle Group or its clients. So having said all of that, uh, we, here's a brief overview of our talk today. So the first, we're going to talk about a background and to give some context into the research environment that this work was done. Then we'll introduce and explain vehicle to everything, the V2X concept, what it is, definitions. Then we'll introduce the, the V2X value stream framework which is really the core of this work, along with the discussion of regulatory policy issues in the energy industry. And finally, we will conclude with some overall uh, conclusions. So first, the case for electric vehicles. So the transportation sector accounts for approximately one quarter of global energy related carbon emissions and light duty passenger vehicles, that is to say uh, your individual cars account for over half of that total and their impact is expected to grow over time. And as we all know, uh, significant greenhouse gas reduction is needed across industry to restrict global average temperature rise to two degrees Celsius. And the IA has indicated that nearly one fifth of that uh, greenhouse gas reduction will need to come from the transportation sector. And so lithium ion battery technology offers the best combination of power, energy and cost compared to other electrochemical storage technologies. And actually another important uh, element that we need to talk about as well is weight. 
So when we say energy, we mean not only energy capacity, the amount of energy that can be held, but the energy density. So the amount of energy per weight, and especially in electric vehicles, this is an important cost factor. And so current trends, which we'll show in a moment, uh, point to reduced costs, increased production, and increased energy density. So as a partial solution to these uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals is the replacement of ICE vehicles. So that's internal combustion engine vehicles with EVs and PHEVs. And again, we say partial solution because there's not going to be an and or solution to the problems that we'll face in the future, but uh, a, an all above approach. And finally, uh, aggressive global EV and PHEV sales and growth goals are expected to result in between 130 to 220 million EVs worldwide by 2030, according to the IEA, the International Energy Agency. So in short, the electromobility paradigm is coming. And so here we have a chart of some of the trends in lithium ion battery technology. Uh, here on the left, we have uh, battery cost, which is expressed in US dollars per kilowatt hour. Whereas on the right, we have battery energy density, and this is watt hours per liter. So that is to clarify, this is volumetric energy density. And we can see two complementary trends. On the one hand, we have a very sharp reduction in costs over time, paired with an increase in battery density over time as well. And we can see here in 2020, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a little green dash here at right about at right at 100 US dollars per kilowatt hour. And this is a, a goal, very important goal for many reasons, primarily, primarily being that this is where it's thought that uh, electric vehicles will be cost competitive with ICE vehicles. So, you know, we maybe hear a lot in the renewables world about grid parity for solar and wind resources. In the EV world, we talk about ICE parity, and that's the point at which EVs are cost competitive with ICE vehicles. And so we can see, as of 2018, Tesla had claimed that they were at $124 per kilowatt hour. And so we are well on our way to realizing those goals. And in fact, I'm going to pop out of the presentation for a second and show some updated figures, which I hope everyone can see, um, and that the IEA, uh, recently announced that in 2019, we have in fact surpassed the $100 per kilowatt hour uh, goal. And so it's, it's important to note that these costs are cell costs. So that is the individual battery cells. So battery cells are uh, grouped together into modules, which are grouped together into battery packs. And at each level, you add some sophistication, some protection, additional materials, which of course increase the cost. So this is an important number at the cell level, but at the pack level, to kind of give everyone uh, some context as well, this is where we're at currently. We also have a large reduction in costs over time. This is from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And in 2018, the average costs were approximately $176 per kilowatt hour at the pack level. And I believe in 2019, they've just published uh, a new numbers saying that it's closer to $150 per kilowatt hour now. So these are all encouraging trends, um, which shows the potential of electric vehicles as being a very viable alternative to ICE. So this leads us to what is V2X. So vehicle to everything is an umbrella term to explain the use of EV batteries to provide energy services and derive additional value from the battery asset during times of non-use for mobility. That's very important to, to understand that when we talk about V2X, it's assumed and understood that this is a secondary use of the battery, whereas the primary use, of course, in electric vehicles for mobility. And if you think about it, if you look outside now, there's tons of cars and trucks parked and in fact, utilization rates of privately owned vehicles are very low. And, and research has indicated that over 90% of the economic life of the vehicle, a uh, vehicle asset is effectively parked and unused. So if you think of how often you actually use your vehicle over its usable lifetime, it's actually quite low. And so in the case of electric vehicles, you have uh, potentially a very large energy asset that is sitting there being unused that could be um, 
uh, used over time. And so V2X Services aims to generate revenue from this battery asset, again, during times of non-use, through dynamic, so that means controllable, unidirectional or bidirectional charging. And sometimes we'll see uh, V1X is used to denote one directional, so that is you can only, or smart charging sometimes it's called, whereas V2X is bidirectional charge control, that is charging and discharging to the grid. And the idea behind V2X services is to use these operating modes to provide benefits to the electric grid, to reduce, flatten, or shift peak energy consumption of buildings and homes, or to provide emergency backup power or regular backup power to a load. And so when we're talking about V2X energy services, we're referring to leveraging this dynamic charge control in the form of aggregated flexible capacity. And this is important because in the face of increasing renewables penetration, there's going to be increasing need for flexibility and storage in the electrical system in order to continue the reliable operation of the grid. And so V2X topology is, it's a ref, we refer to both the electrical connection involved and the operation mode employed. And that we have designated four primary topologies. And so that is vehicle to load, V2L, vehicle to home, V2H, vehicle to building, V2B, and what most people know when they hear about V2X is vehicle to grid, the most well-known of the topologies. But it's wanted to emphasize that V2G is just one of the many topologies that V2X encompasses. And so here they are, the, the various topologies in a, a nice, uh, picture. I always say pictures tell more than a thousand words. And I'll go through them in uh, ink from the lowest complexity to the greatest complexity. So in the simplest we have here in red is V2L. And if you can think of that, that's any instance where you have an individual vehicle providing energy to a load. And actually I remember uh, when I was at Berkeley one time, I attended what they were calling an all solar concert. And what they had was a, a Nissan Leaf that was actually hooked up and they were running the PA system, their electricity and running all of the amps from the concert that the, uh, from the vehicle that had been previously charged using solar panels. So it's where they get the all solar concert. And I thought that's just a, a very neat and creative use case of the V2L concept that perfectly illustrates uh, the kind of possibilities there are. And consequently, or, or paradoxically, really, uh, the V2L has been the least researched of the different topologies up until now. So uh, the next order of complexity is V2H. And so this is where we have one or possible multiple vehicles interacting with uh, a home. So potentially interacting with rooftop solar or uh, on-site battery storage as well. If you think about the, the Tesla Powerwall uh, or the Vsan or the Nissan uh, V2H systems that are in the market today. The next level of complexity then is where we make a significant step is because now we're not talking about individual vehicles, we're talking about fleets. So at the V2B, the vehicle to building level, we're now talking about aggregating really. Aggregation of entire fleets to provide energy services and to buildings and this can operate both on the supply side. So we see up here, we have in the generation side, but also to the demand side. So these have our different uh, uh, strata of the commercial, residential and industrial consumers. And we, we made a distinction in that a microgrid is actually just a special use case of the B2B concept. Whereas in the microgrid, you're interacting with uh, a number of other uh, distributed energy resources, solar, micro wind, other battery storage perhaps, and it's constrained to a site, but the primary connection point at the end is for buildings. So we said it's a, it's a special use case of the V2B concept. Whereas finally V2G is talking about large scale fleets providing and interacting directly with the greater electric grid. And we note that we have highlighted the distribution system operator due to its, 
this DSO central importance in enabling a lot of this V2X uh, because most uh, V2X energy services will be connecting at the lower voltage or maybe medium voltage grid, which is within the purview of the distribution system operator. So the DSO has a very strong, important enabling role to play for V2X. And so the idea behind the value stream framework um, was to better communicate the full economic potential of V2X. At that time, you know, we, we had a lot of terms that were being conflated, uh, being used incorrectly, and there was a lot of kind of confusion in, in the literature as to what we meant by these terms. And so the intention with this value stream framework is to better communicate what those topologies are and better communicate the economic potential of it. And we chose value for a very specific reason instead of revenue, because revenue is dependent on uh, the market conditions and dependent also on the regulatory context that uh, actors have to operate in, which in many cases, the market regulation in the energy industry uh, is not caught up to be able to extract the full value that V2X or other fast acting resources can potentially offer the energy system. And so this is why we decided to denote it as value stream framework versus revenue. And so we have three main areas where this value is derived from. And this is from interaction with wholesale markets, interaction with transmission and distribution operators directly. So no market involved or uh, interacting with customers. And again, residential, uh, industrial and uh, normal consumers. And so some of the key assumptions with V2X is that V2X can provide most services as batteries, battery, G, uh, battery energy stationary storage, so BESS, uh, but at a reduced scale. And indeed, a lot of the pilot projects that have been uh, working in this area have, have proven that fleet aggregated uh, electric vehicles can provide similar services within the technical requirements needed uh, at the same level as battery energy uh, stationary storage systems. Uh, but naturally at a reduced scale because we're talking about individual electric vehicles with you know, 50 to 100 kilowatt hour batteries each. And so another key uh, kind of assumption with this work is that BESS would be actually the primary competitor to V2X. And this is because while both are based on the same costs, similar costs, because they're based on the same technology, uh, there's going to be an interesting question as to uh, the dynamics involved and in that, whereas BESS has typically larger capacities, larger sizes, there's a lot of additional costs involved with stationary storage systems. Primarily among that is the land siding costs, balance of, uh, uh, balance of system costs as well. Whereas V2X, they have significantly reduced capital costs compared to BESS. However, with V2X, you have this increased complexity issue where if you're coordinating several different vehicles up to the hundreds, perhaps, there's a, a, a communication and telemetric complexity involved as well. So we, we suspect that we'll see some niche areas where V2X might fill that BESS is either too large or too expensive to fill and vice versa, that BESS will take care of areas that are um, capacity limited to, uh, sorry, that V2X will not be able to enter due to its limited capacity. And then finally, that V2X will actually exhibit co-petition behavior. And so co-petition is, is a fancy economic word for competition and cooperation con uh, together. And that a lot of the same regulatory reforms that will benefit V2X will also benefit best. And so we would expect that BESS and V2X would cooperate in lobbying uh, regulatory reform, but compete directly in the market for these products. And so this is what uh, the value stream framework is. And we'll kind of go around the outside here and work our way in. Uh, so we have up at the top, we have the different sectors of where each of these value streams uh, operates in, either the wholesale markets uh, directly with utilities or system operators or with individual customers. We have the value stream, or what is what we're referring to. We have the definition of the value stream uh, uh, and we distinguish between 
when we are referring to uh, unidirectional charge control, so V1G, V1B, et cetera, or bidirectional charge control, and how they derive that, uh, how they provide that service in each case. And finally, where the value is derived, whether that's through uh, resource adequacy mechanisms, whether that's through the ancillary services markets, or whether that's through participation in the wholesale market itself. Uh, then over here, we have the four topologies, as we mentioned before, and below an idea of the scale of the number of vehicles we're talking about here. And we can see that the, the, at the V2H and the V2L level, we're, we're still operating in singular and that individual vehicles are providing services. But once we get to higher levels, V2B, V2H, it then becomes an aggregated resource and requires a, a special aggregator to operate them and to optimally bid them into markets. Finally, we have also a distinction between where these uh, services are provided, either in front of the meter or behind the meter. And we made a key distinction between power and energy resources. And I'll go into I'll show some examples to explain that concept. So frequency regulation, in some places it's called secondary reserves, is a fast charging and discharging uh, to be able to follow a signal to compensate for uh, second or sub-second fluctuations in the frequency of the electric grid. Uh, usually it's a, it's a four second to eight second regulation signal that is sent out. And the reason why we call, we distinguish this as a power value stream is that the service that's being offered is actually charge flexibility. So that is the response time to large fluctuations in charge. But if the frequency regulation signal is balanced, so the average uh, positive and negative uh, charge versus discharge is relatively balanced, the net energy exchange is relatively low, which leads to a relatively small impact in the state of charge of the electric vehicle. So this is why we designate a power-based resource versus other uh, resources which are more energy-based and uh, I'll go in through a couple of examples here. So uh, at the time, a lot of V2G uh, research was done looking only at the economic questions between revenues from energy arbitrage and spinning reserves. So energy arbitrage, uh, as the name implies, is where you buy electricity uh, when it's cheap, sell it when it's expensive, and the revenue is derived from the arbitrage between those times. And so in this case, what's actually being offered is energy discharge, which is why we have uh, denoted this as an energy-based resource. Uh, another very interesting value stream is this network deferral. And so this is employing electric vehicles or fleets uh, in certain capacity constrained areas. And here in this case, when we're talking about capacity constrained, we mean the distribution or uh, probably distribution uh, because it's a lower voltage lines uh, so that uh, V uh, or a fleet of vehicles could potentially interrupt their charge or uh, accept uh, a charge during times of high demand in order to lower the demand at peak moments uh, to meet projected load growth in capacity constrained areas. And the idea with this is that if you are able to flatten the peak, you may be able to reduce the transmission distribution build out, the infrastructure that's required to be built over time. And the last one I will talk about a little bit is this bill management. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, for example, this is more at the customer level when uh, taking advantage of time of use rate tariffs, for example, or using your electric vehicle to interact with your home load um, energy profile to balance it and to optimize your energy use so this is the overall value stream framework. And so to continue on this, we conducted a, a meta-analysis of the value, V2X value streams. Uh, really it's a meta-meta analysis because each of the primary data sources were each studies of the value of each of these value streams in and of themselves. Uh, and we have them here in a, a num, uh, organized by medium value uh, ordered by medium value. And we represented them in the baseline as annual value, that is dollars per kilowatt per year. 
uh, as a way to compare across the different studies. And we see a couple of interesting things here. One is that there's a very large spread in potential value bet between different markets. Uh, so that is to say that uh, the economic argument or the, the value proposition in one market may be very different and from one to the next. And so it's very difficult to say that this is the most valuable uh, value stream. This is where uh, the business case is because it very much depends on localized factors. We see that as evident as the spreads here. Uh, another interesting thing to note is that despite most of the prior research being done on energy arbitrage and spinning reserve, they tend to be the lowest valued uh, value streams out of all of them. And the final interesting thing to note here is that uh, with the exception of bill management, the remaining uh, highly ranked value streams are all power-based value streams. And this also has implications for battery degradations because if you have a service that does not require very large changes in state of charge, so that is to say very deep depths of discharge cycles, that has a very important impact on battery degradation. So even though it's very difficult to make a generalized statement about uh, the, the inherent value of a given value stream by looking at the individual, and these are wholesale markets in the US, so CAISO, ERICOT, ISO, NEM, ISO, and ISO PJM, uh, we see a surprising mm, conformity of the same ordered pairs and the same values in each market. We do have notable exceptions though, however, in PJM with the frequency of regulation, and this is most likely because at the time, the PJM had instituted the, the Reg D signal, uh, which was a energy balanced and fast acting new regulation signal. Uh, and that as a consequence, there was a lot of battery storage that entered into the market of PJM. They've since uh, backtracked on the benefits for this service. And so I would, I would be surprised if this is still the case. So, this brings us to the regulatory issues around V2X. And so really uh, V2X regulation is centered around aggregator access to energy markets. And so what is an aggregator? It's a, a third party that coordinates these individual vehicles and submits economic bids to either the energy market, to the ancillary services market, or no, can uh, operate and interact with a building's energy profile to provide benefits either to the grid or to buildings, et cetera. And so the overall goals with the discussion uh, and for regulatory change for V2X is to, first of all, remove administrative barriers to aggregation of energy sources. In many markets, uh, there's an outright ban on aggregation of small scale sources. Uh, and Second, to define fair rules, which has two kind of subparts. So one is uh, allow for greater aggregator access and two, through developing technology agnostic energy service definitions. In many cases, in many markets, um, especially in the ancillary services, these are defined based on the limitations of thermal uh, power plants. So gas, coal, et cetera. And so uh, by developing technology agnostic energy services, it, it levels the playing field for everyone. And the third is to develop equitable remuneration scheme, which incentivize actors to reveal the true costs while ensuring they are compensated for the full value of service they provide. And so to kind of frame this discussion, um, we developed this modular approach to V2X aggregator regulation. This was, um, influence as well to some of our other colleagues in the research lab at the time. Um, and it, it boils down to a, a modular approach, which is these three modules, A, B, and C. And one is uh, the definition of aggregation. Second, definition of energy products, what they are. And third is the definition of remuneration. And you can see there's certain sub modules within each one. And this boils down to a, a quick uh, kind of flow chart to think about V2X and aggregator regulation is to answer these simple questions is that for module A is do the rules in the market allow aggregators to provide energy services? If they don't, then there's no entry in the market. Uh, if they do allow for 
aggregators to participate, do the rules then allow aggregators to provide at their full capacity? And if not, then you will have suboptimal bids in the market and uh, V2X will not be able to provide the full value that, uh, that it has, the full potential that it has. And thirdly, is that do the rules then allow aggregators to extract the full value of the service that is to be remunerated, to be paid for the service, the value that they provide. If there is, uh, if the rules are designed in a way so there's suboptimal remuneration, then we'll also have a reduced penetration of V2X because we're not able to make enough money. So I won't go into too much detail uh, in these next couple of sections. Uh, I would refer everyone to the original paper, um, but kind of in module A, the definition of aggregation what we're talking about is, is there's certain situations of technical discrimination. One being there's an, uh, in many markets, there's an outright ban on aggregation. And so this precludes V2X from the market ipso facto. So by definition, um, and when there's no concept of consumption in the market. So negative generation or storage units, if these don't even exist as a concept, then clearly bi-directional charge control will not be able to participate. And then finally, and oftentimes there's a preference given to specific connection points at the electric grid. So the high voltage or medium voltage level and, and priorities given to large capacity resources. Uh, another question is about interoperability of DSOs. Uh, this is less important for most other topologies. It's really only necessary for V2G when aggregating individual vehicles. So if you think if you're trying to conduct a symphony uh, of electric vehicle charging where individuals are moving all of which way and the other, they can move from one distribution service area to another during the day. And if those two distribution system operators are not talking to one another, there's no interoperability. It makes the, uh, the, the complicated, the, the complexity issue becomes uh, too difficult. And finally, this question of aggregation methodology. An aggregation can either be telemetric or financial. Telemetric means that the aggregator is in charge of both uh, power dispatch, so that it's charging and discharging the electric vehicles, and for the submission of economic bids, whereas financial aggregation, the aggregator is only permitted to submit fine, uh, economic bids, whereas the system operator actually ultimately controls the dispatch. So the overall goal with this module is to remove barriers to aggregation, allow for DSO operability, and allow for telemetric aggregation. Module B is talking about the definition of energy products, such as the bid structure, what is the minimum size bid, what's the minimum increment, uh, the temporal granularity, so uh, what is the size of the block, which can be one hour, four hour blocks, I've even, in some cases, even weekly blocks. And also the type of bids is simple versus complex. Um, in some markets, such as Spain, as example, uh, bidders into the electricity market can submit complex conditions with their bids. One such example is the minimum income condition where a, a bid will not be accepted unless it is guaranteed a minimum income over the span of the bid. So this is an example of uh, what a complex is, whereas a simple bid is, is just uh, a certain amount of energy for a certain hour. Uh, then there's a the question of this uh, power versus energy balance. Again, because the uh, for capacity constrained resources, uh, large energy intense services will be prohibitive it's very important to understand what is the actual impact to the electric vehicle of providing the service. This also has implications for battery degradation, which if we have some time at the end, we can talk some more about. Um, and so we proposed several new statistics that could be uh, to measure how much energy is used per contract period or to measure the power intensity of a given service. Another question is the distance to real-time reservation. So how far in advance of provision a service must be bid? If it's hour ahead, if it's week ahead, that's a drastic, it makes a drastic difference. And finally, this uh, question of value stream stacking. And so this is a, an interesting area where uh, recent developments might be indicative of where markets will go. And that in CAISO, so that's California ISO, they recently made a ruling on multiple use applications specifically for battery storage systems, and that the same capacity could be designated for multiple uh, services over 
time. And it's, it's, this is a very good example of how the regulator has an enabling role to play in allowing V2X to, to penetrate to the market. And then finally, it's a question of product symmetry. So if there are symmetric bids that are required, uh, so for the example, for the case of uh, reserves, if you're having to provide both upwards and downwards reserve at the same ratio, then clearly a V1G resource would not be able to participate if they are also required to, uh, to, to discharge back to the grid, which they would not be able to do. So the goal with the second module is to have low minimum bid sides and low increments. Uh, the, the playing field of about 100 kilowatts is, is uh, accessible to V2X. So with short time horizons, ideally hourly, but four hour discharge times is possible. Uh, allow for multiple use applications and allow for non-symmetric complex bids. And finally, module C is definition of remuneration. So what is the nature of the payment? Whether the service is provided versus a regulated, a regulated or a market solution, uh, whether within a market solution, we then have a pay as bid. So this is where each participant in the market is paid at the level that they bid at versus uniform pricing, whereas each participant receives the marginal price uh, that is cleared for each hour. And so with pay as bid, it has, a, it has the tendency to erode the consumer benefit because uh, individual actors will tend to overbid uh, what their actual costs are in attempts to try to bid as high as possible to get below the um, below the marginal bid. Whereas with uniform pricing, it incentivizes actors to show their actual uh, costs because everyone, even if for the marginal cost bid and the lowest cost bid all receives the same marginal price. And so this also there's the question of uh, mandatory versus voluntary service offer, whether if you're providing a service, you have to provide the service always, or if you can choose when to provide it very important for electric vehicles, you can imagine, because people use their vehicles, they charge at different times and it's and it will not always have a constant resource. This is one of the complexity issues with V2X. And finally, if there is a performance bonus, so typically energy service product definitions are based on thermal generation limitations. And if there's a need for greater flexibility, fast response and greater availability, and uh, a resource can provide that, over the baseline, then that's an additional ability that should be compensated. And so if there are performance bonuses and schemes for if and how uh, performance above the baseline is defined and rewarded. And so the goal with this module is for advocating for market solutions with uniform pricing and voluntary service offers with clear performance metrics and incentives for overachievement of the baseline. And so to kind of wrap up here, uh, V2X is still regarded as a nascent technology. So regulatory barriers exist, but the first steps are largely administrative. Uh, V2X shows reduced capital costs compared to best. Uh, if you think uh, large uh, land siting is a very large cost of best that I mentioned previously, or which, which you don't have for V2X. Uh, and finally, hardware enabling costs have reduced approximately by 90% since 2014. And by hardware enabling costs, we're meaning the marginal cost of going from a V1G, so a smart charger, to a bi-directional V2G charger. Those costs have reduced by approximately 90% since 2014. And finally, the economic viability of V2X must be analyzed and applied only to the market context in which this analysis is conducted. Uh, because of the uh, plethora of localized factors in each market, uh, the same value stream may not have a, a economically viable proposal in one market, but can be very interesting in another. And so overall power-based value streams tend to exhibit higher, the highest potential across markets. And furthermore, stacking these value streams will be essential to the economic viability of V2X going forward. And we believe that the future of V2X will be directed towards the bill management, network deferral, resource adequacy, and frequency regulation value streams. 
And finally, V2X is an innovative development in the energy industry that is not only market driven, but driven by regulatory policy. And as such, regulators have an enabling role to play. And so with that, uh, for anyone who is interested, uh, the majority of this work is in the first paper there. And there's also an additional paper for those who are interested in battery degradation uh, costs uh, and talking about more the echo, uh, sorry, the electrochemical degradation uh, mechanisms that are in play for battery degradation. And so with that, I will open up the floor to questions. And I love questions, so please feel free. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I would like to echo some of the participants' comments uh, for this extremely thorough presentation and information-packed tables that be a great resource to many of us. So thank you for this. Uh, one of the questions is, um, does the value stream meta-analysis look at future market conditions as we move to more renewables? Uh, did that say future market conditions? Yeah. No, so this was a, a snapshot at a certain point in time. So most of the, so all of these studies uh, were looking at market conditions at the time of the study. And another thing I should add is that uh, because each study had different assumptions for the uh, amount of time that a service would be provided over time, the uh, energy capacity that would be provided over time, which is why we normalize them all to this annual value, dollars per kilowatt per year metric to be able to compare across all of the different studies. Thank you. Do you see a future where we would be discharging those uh, batteries at a much higher power rates that we currently do? And we currently do it at 10 kilowatt. And if we are to move towards higher charging and uh, discharging rates, uh, do you think uh, the chemistries of the battery would need to change significantly to allow this? Yes, so good question. So, so naturally, as we go to higher discharge, uh, char char charge and discharge rates, that actually erodes some of the benefits for some of these services, right? If we are, uh, if we now can charge our electric vehicles, it doesn't take us eight hours to charge the vehicle overnight and we can do the same thing in one hour, then we only have one hour's worth of time to play with the, the charge levels of these electric vehicles, right? And so that in a way erodes some of the benefits for some of these services, but for the power-based services, as we saw, that will actually increase because now you're able to offer larger power swings. So if you say that if you're charging at 10 kilowatts, for example, you can charge and discharge right at 10 kilowatts. So really you have a 20 kilowatt hour, or sorry, 20 kilowatt window of power flexibility that you can play with. So that actually increases it. And I believe the second part of that question was a bit on chemistry. Uh, yes, yes. So um, and that's something that they're currently working on. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the work that I had done at this time is, is nearly obsolete because now the battery technology is evolving so rapidly um, that uh, the, the chemistries and the form factors are increasing at such a, a, a fast rate as that things that were published even two years ago are now being largely obsolete. So I, I do have some slides at, at the end about battery chemistry if, if we have some more questions related to that. Yeah, we actually just got a question about what is the optimum use case considering battery life degradation how would you uh, value streams? Okay. So, and this is really contained in the second paper, but I do have some slides for this as well. So uh, I have to preface this a little bit and that uh, this is the, this is a, a structure, uh, um, an illustrative structure of what a lithium battery is actually composed of. So you have four main elements. You have an anode, you have a cathode, you have uh, an electrolyte between the two, and this is an aqueous solution, and you have a separator. So this ensures that the cathode and the anode, they don't have a, sh um, a short. Um, and so all of these in red are the various electrochemical degradation mechanisms that cause batteries to degrade. So when we talk about battery life fade, we're actually talking about two things. One is the actual capacity that the battery has so 
over time, the usable capacity will reduce, right? And another is the power fade that's called sometimes, which is as over time, the internal impedance of the battery will increase, which means that you're able, you're unable to extract as much power from the battery as you were before, which is why it's called power fade sometimes. So all of these degradation mechanisms uh, manifest themselves into two complementary aging behaviors. And these are called calendar aging and cycling aging. Calendar aging is the, the degradation, the aging that takes place when the battery is not in use. Current is zero, the battery is just sitting there. Whereas cycling aging is what we intuitively think as uh, degradation. The more you charge and discharge the battery, the more you cycle the battery, the more it degrades over time. And intuitively, we think that the more we use the battery, the more we lose it. And actually, that is not the case because calendar aging is the larger life degradation component. And I always uh, send people to this paper. It was very, very good work. And we see here a number of different um, temperature tests. In blue, we have the combined degradation impact. Uh, in green, we have the calendar aging impact. And you can't quite see, but this is supposed to be red, is the impact from cycling aging. And now, especially in the case for electric vehicles, if they're going to be stationary for the majority of their lifetimes, so 90% or more, that in fact, the impact from calendar aging is going to, de uh, to, to dominate the overall lifetime fade. And as we can see, at normal operating temperatures, so 20 to 34 degrees Celsius, the calendar aging component is by far the larger degradation component of overall life fade. Now, this has to come also with a caveat because everything depends on everything. Uh, so we have actually three axes that we're talking about here. Here, and we're looking at capacity loss, right? So inverse of capacity. Here, we have the amp hour throughput. So this is the amount of amps that are both put into and taken out of the battery. Whereas here, we have at the Z axis, we have the C rate. And so this is a charge rate. So this is uh, when battery scientists and battery engineers talk about C-rate, they're referring to a normalized charge um, uh, a current, right? So that is to say a C-rate of one C is a, a current that would charge or discharge a battery in one hour. A C-rate of two C is the current that would charge or discharge the, that, that battery in 30 minutes whereas one half C would be to charge that same battery in two hours, right? So as we go into higher charge rates, higher C rates, we do see that there's an inflection point where the cycling aging does take over. Um, and it's even more noticeable at low temperatures. And that is actually because of this particle cracking uh, problem that exhibits itself much more at lower temperatures. Whereas in the rest in the majority of other cases, and in fact, it's temperature more than any other component that will decrease battery life. So I know this is quite a, quite a, a long-winded <laughs> answer to that, but I hope it gave some of the, the backgrounds to it. So I guess to, to sum up of how this impacts V2X is that instead of having your battery sitting in a hot car cooking over time. So in effect, the most um, uh, negatively impactful uh, operation of an EV battery is to have it sit for long periods of time at high states of charge and high temperatures. And in fact, that by lowering potentially, if you think of a use case where instead of having your vehicle sit at 90% state of charge, you first discharge down to 50%, perform frequency regulation at around a nominal 50% state of charge. So you're charging and discharging, but it's the power flexibility that's being offered. Your state of charge is not changing very much from 50%. And so that the benefits from mitigating calendar aging are actually more than compensate the increased cycling aging. And this is how V2X can help. 
Thank you. Um, another one on degradation. This study, is it based on data collected from real world operation of electric vehicles? And if not, what is the importance of uh, uh, understanding degradation based on actual real life conditions compared to just uh, from data in the lab? Yes, also very good points. Yes, yeah, so these so these aging studies are typically done in lab environments. This one as well was done in a lab environment. And you can see here that this is on a, a nickel cobalt manganese um, um, uh, battery chemistry. Um, these are typically accelerated aging studies as well. So that is to say, because you can't divorce time uh, from the testing process, what they do is accelerated studies in many cases and that they basically cook the batteries at very high temperatures and aggressively cycle them over time. Um, this study is a bit different in that it had a very wide test matrix of both storage conditions and cycling conditions. And so they were able to extract some of the more minute details to, to come up with this graph is what, what they were showing at the very end. Um, and so, of course, the way that, and the, uh, so not just the way the batteries are operated, but also the stresses that are induced are different in a lab environment than they are in real world use. And so this is the natural next step progression is to look at real world um, uh, use of electric vehicles providing these services. And that's what a lot of the pilot projects are all about. So for example, at the at, at, uh, Berkeley National Labs, there's a pilot project working on the uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base. We had a fleet of electric vehicles providing V2G resources. Um, and I, to my knowledge, it is one of the most well and longest, so well-developed and longest serving pilot projects. But they are now, there are so many, there's so many more going on right now. And are you aware if uh, battery, battery data is available? Because usually this is very sensitive data. Yes, it is very sensitive data and unfortunately, highly proprietary. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, that's uh, in, in, in academia, it's quite difficult to get your hands on it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I suppose as long as the car makers are uh, providing warranties for those vehicles to participate in those kinds of services, then the customer will have a better peace of mind. What's yes, and, and, and that's a very interesting point too, is because just recently they started putting warranties for battery capacity into the, the electric vehicle warranties before, if you, if you read the fine print, what was only being offered was um, the, the electric powertrain. So they're saying that the vehicle will still work, but we are not explicitly guaranteeing capacity. This was until uh, you had the, the, what was called the wilted leaf um, problem with Nissan Leafs is that the battery chemistry that they were using did not have sufficient thermal isolation. And in fact, there was no thermal management um, for the battery itself. And because of that, they had very drastic capacity reductions over time. And so that's why they call it the wilted leaf. It dries up under temperature. <laughs> and uh, Nissan actually, uh, in response to the class action lawsuit that was filed, explicitly now will guarantee their capacity in their battery packs as well. I believe it's like 70% over five, the first five years, you will have at least 70%, which is as quite low actually. As opposed to what? What changed? Sorry? What has changed? So before there was no explicit warranty for the battery capacity. They only said that the vehicle will still work. That is the powertrain will still work, right? So an electric vehicle, the powertrain that will still push the vehicle forward, it's still physically working, but if you only have a battery capacity of 30 kilowatt hours and you started with 100, it drastically reduces the usefulness of it as an electric vehicle. However, the powertrain itself is still intact, it's still working, right? So that's the difference. Now they're explicitly guaranteeing a warranty of the capacity. So that is to say explicitly guaranteeing the range that you will maintain. Did thank that, you. That Can you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Can you uh, briefly explain uh, front of the meter and behind the meter operation? And also, have you come across? This is a separate question. Have you come across 
comparison between uh, V1G and V2G, so vehicle to grid and smart charging, like in what cases do we need V2G? You did, you did uh, put on one slide that the cost of V2G is becoming very close to a smart charger, so that could justify deploying V2G. But in general, what if we get most of the benefits from smart charging? Hmm. Yeah, also good question. So what is the marginal benefit of V2G over V1G, right? If we have um, more expensive inverter components in the chargers, if we have increased security measures that need to be placed in the chargers. So what's the benefit if we can do it just with V1G? So the answer to that is V2G allows for a much larger window, uh, both for power and for energy discharge over time. So if you can imagine in a V1G scenario, you can only charge or stop charging effectively, or charge at a higher rate or charge at a lower rate. That, those are the parameters that you have to, to deal with. And if you have a seven kilowatt, hour, a seven kilowatt power connection, you have a seven kilowatt window with which to play with. Whereas with V2G, that same vehicle now has a 14 kilowatt uh, window that can be used and that there can be certain situations in which a vehicle just sitting that is charging at a rate of zero that is halfway between the, the nominal operating point between full charge and full discharge can actually be providing services. So that's one of the benefits of V2G over V1G, right? So reduced power windows that you can play with and reduced, um, sorry, V2G has increased power windows and increased energy discharge um, that, that it can potentially offer the, over V1G. Do we have numbers if the, this justifies the increase in cost and complexity and rolling out V2G infrastructure? Yes, yes, they, they have done research. I know um, at the Technical University of Denmark, they have looked fairly extensively into uh, real world energy, uh, real world battery impact, one thing of frequency regulation. So vehicles providing frequency regulation and also uh, bidding into markets. What's the actual value proposition? I would have to refer you to their paper um, yeah. and their research. Thank you. But to Back give to kind the of, question. Yeah, Go on. sorry. Maybe to kind of give a, a, an orientative um, look is that in a pilot project at Los Angeles Air Force Base, I believe uh, they were uh, making upwards of $200 per vehicle per month, I believe at the time for providing V2G services. But again, like uh, this, the whole point of the V2X value stream framework and this meta study was to show that it's very dependent on the localized market factors. We have a couple of more questions and I'm aware we're close to uh, seven o'clock your time. Are you fine to stay for another five minutes? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. Thank you. So back to a question was, how do you qualify or quantify in front of the meter operation? Yes, so uh, behind the meter operation is things that are contained within a, a building contained within a home. And so there's no, in, there's no interaction with other grid elements. Um, and so this is the same, um, it's the same operation as if you have rooftop solar. There are, there are different ways that you can operate them so that you are solely self-consumption, right? And by only self-consuming the solar power that you generate, you have no need to interact with the greater grid because there's no bi-directional component, right? And so that is behind the meter because you are only receiving energy and, and the system operator doesn't need to know what's going on behind the meter effectively. Whereas in front of the meter, because you're, in, you're interacting with other grid elements, so the distribution system specifically for most of these, but in, in the larger capacity scales, potentially transmission system as well, um, there are a lot of more uh, security that's necessary. So anti-islanding is a very important uh, capability that needs to be implemented as well. And also communication 
because if it's a dispatchable resource, the technical, so the system operator or distribution system operator needs to be able to communicate with that resource. Thank you. You briefly mentioned the cybersecurity uh, on the importance of uh, security on V2G charges, for example. Uh, do you have information of what are the minimum requirements we would need the hardware of those chargers to be to ensure cyber secu security? Are there any work on this? Yes, so I actually would uh, direct you to next week's uh, webinar, right, Miriam? I believe uh, uh, the Alan Turing Institute's been doing a lot of work on this, right? We're hosting, we're hosting people talking on cybersecurity, yes. But it's always a, thank you, but it's always a rec recurring question of what is the minimum hardware software re requirement that you would have on a charger to ensure it's going to be cyber secure, considering that security is always a moving target. So we need to be keeping up with a changing environment. It is an open-ended question. I just wanted to check with you if you're aware of uh, something else that we might not be aware. Okay, two more, two more questions. Uh, uh, have you come across differences between AC and DC? Right now, most of the chargers are DC. Are we heading towards a diversification? Uh, so I believe you mean to say most chargers are AC, right? The, so DC The V2G is, chargers are mostly DC. Yeah, the higher voltage, or sorry, the higher power levels, that's correct. Yep. But at the lower power levels, which is what we normally are talking with V, so for V1, uh, sorry, V2H, V2L, uh, the individual chargers are normally AC. Um, and uh, if if I was coming up against the difference between the chargers, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Just to confirm with you, you mean the currently the V2G chargers are AC? No, the, yeah. the lower power levels, the higher power levels are going to DC. Yeah, so do you have, do you, do you see uh, one of the options uh, taken over in the future? Uh, see a diversification? Yeah, um, I think a lot of that too uh, it's, comes to a question of standardization. Uh, I know in Europe, it's an ongoing conversation and I'm certain in the US as well as to what are going to be the standards going forward and, and the interoperability between electric vehicles and electric chargers. And so I think the question of AC versus DC is also wrapped up in this standardization conversation yeah. as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Okay, last one. Um, how supportive are the car makers for uh, V2X currently? There's a handful of ones that are supporting it. Yeah, it's uh, and it's changed actually over time. I think, and and it's very interesting too. I'll, I'll single out Tesla just because it's kind of the elephant in the room. In the beginning, yeah. Tesla was very anti against anything V2, V2X. Um, despite being uh, participating in one of the very first pilot projects, I believe back in 2007, I think it was, it's, you know, 13 years ago. Um, and basically um, they were very non, let's say non-responsive. Um, but recently uh, Elon Musk himself has come out saying things like we should re look back into this, right? And so I think a part of that is too, is the awareness of the different value streams that are out there. And also it's just the case in point is that battery costs have reduced drastically since 13 years ago. And so that's yeah. changing the economics significantly. Well, I was actually discussing uh, with a colleague in DTU yesterday exactly about Tesla. And we just, uh, we're, we're thinking Tesla already have the hardware that's that it needs to do V2G and it's just a software update and the cars can start. Yeah. Yeah, so they're definitely planning ahead. And I will say, I know Nissan from the very beginning has been very supportive. Nissan participated in many of the pilot projects. They yeah. already have a V2H system, I know, in Japan, in the market yeah. right now. Um, yeah. And BMW with the, uh, with the, I believe the i3 um, was involved in, in a number of pilot projects as well. So it, I think the, the, interest from industry has increased significantly uh, as we are better able to communicate 
this concept. And also as we're getting back the preliminary results from a lot of these first pilot projects, we're now on the second and third um, iteration of a lot of these. So I think the, the industry support is there. Yeah, so the Japanese uh, Nissan Mitsubishi using the Chademo protocol have already been doing V2G for a while. Renault, yes, the, exactly. use the ISO 15118 also to do V2G. So yes. Exactly, so, and not yeah. only that, they're wanting to codify bi-directionality in the standardization. And so by having it already there is a very important step. Yeah, very good, okay. Thank you so much for your time. Where can we find more about your work now that you moved away from academia? <laughs> yes. Um, so follow us on brattle.com. Um, brattle does a lot of work in the energy industry. Uh, I know that there is uh, a contingent in the DC, San Francisco, and New York offices that are very much involved in V2, so electric vehicle integration. Um, Bridal does a, not only work as an economic consultancy, but does a lot of work also directly with energy utilities, market design issues, etc. And so I would encourage everyone to visit the webpage and look into the, uh, the energy and utilities practice. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the uh, Thank the you all. Okay. Good questions. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.